Rob Fay is actually a little bit further down south than the Jays. They are in Hillsboro for a series this week with the Hillsboro Hops, pro- probably the most aptly named team in minor league baseball if you've ever been to Portland, and it's a pretty cool hat as well. But the game that is of interest to most baseball fans in the Pacific Northwest is taking place in Seattle. The Blue Jays making their annual trek down to Safeco to meet the reeling Mariners, and the Blue Jays just might be what the doctor ordered from the Mariners not that long ago. Huge, huge, huge 10-game lead. Pretty much thought they were in, as I've been told. But hey, a clock's right twice a day, too. (laughs) But look out, here come the Oakland A's, and they are tied. Now, let's keep in mind, the A's just wiped out the Jays to move into that tie, and now the Mariners get their crack. If the Mariners can't ail, fix what ails them against the Jays, are you willing to call it, KP? Well, I mean, it's a four-game series down in Seattle against the uh, Blue Jays. As we know, it's a pretty bad Blue Jays team. Um, I, they have to, the Mariners have to uh, win at least three out of four here. Um, if they, for, for whatever reason, don't get the job done, um, you know, the slump is continuing. And, uh, you know, they, they still have a bunch of tough Western Division games left this month and in September. And, uh, you know, um, with Oakland is right there, as as you mentioned, Lou. But uh, the team that I've been kind of like uh, thinking is in it is the Angels, and of course Mike Trout's injured, so we don't know what's going to happen. Ten games that. back too. That's pretty That's ambitious. So, well, I mean, you you got the whole month of August and September. Don't forget that we've seen over the years teams choking big leads like that. Uh, so, I mean, with Felix Hernandez going today, um, it's, you know, he basically has to pitch well. You know, uh, the GM has come out, Jared DePoto has come out and kind of suggested that, hey, you know, if the results aren't there, he might not get another start. So, uh, the pressure is definitely on Seattle. Um, the Blue Jays, no pressure at all. So, it should be interesting to see what happens this weekend. So, Niall, early on in the year, of course, the Mariners got off to that great start. And every week, it's like, I don't get it. I don't get it. As someone once said, are the Mariners now who we thought they were? Yeah, it's starting to starting to look that way. But you know what? I'm still I'm still going to keep the faith in the Mariners. I you know I've been holding fast to this since April, and uh, you know KP, I know you're believing in the Angels. I'm not going to dismiss any predictions out of hand anymore. I mean, Chantel was uh, uh, telling us Oakland, don't sleep on them, and sure enough, there they are. Here we are today, Oakland Homer. Seattle tied uh, tied for the American League Wild Card race. Um, yeah, I think definitely having the Blue Jays in town is exactly what the doctor ordered for the Seattle Mariners. And honestly, I think if you're the Mariners, if you don't get at least three out of four in this series, you know. But you know what? I mean, Houston's a pretty darn good team. So let's let's not forget that. Seattle did take the first one uh, with James Paxson. And Paxson, he can still be that guy for you to get you into the playoffs in that one-game playoff. So uh, it looks like Paxson is back now. and healthy ready to go and that's a big that's a big thing for them because let's face it they haven't had paxton for the last little while and uh they need somebody to kind of plug uh plug the leak in the ship right now because felix hernandez it's uh it's pretty sad what's happened to him i mean he's been such a key part of this franchise for so many years i uh, was always throwing 95 96 but the fastball velo just keeps going down 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 and it's when he hits 90 now it's a big deal for him so uh i'm not giving up on the mariners yet so uh but yeah it's you know but you got to give some credit to oakland here oakland's been red hot and then some so you know we just passed the uh the the trade deadline the interleague trade deadline and not that either of those two teams were massively aggressive, but I mean, Seattle, they've got the longest streak of not making the playoffs. Did they, should they have done something to at least give the guys in the clubhouse a hint that, hey, some help's coming? Because, yeah, we know Cano's going to be back, but he can't play in the playoffs. So when you're reeling like that, just watching somebody come in. It, shouldn't they not have done something? Well, uh, Lou, having spoken to um, former Major League players who have been on championship teams, the, the first thing they tell me is, hey, when management goes out there and gets a player or, um, you know, gets some uh 
pitchers, you know, via trades uh, at the trade deadline or just prior to the deadline, that's a huge morale booster for the rest of the team because it's like, hey, management has got our backs and, you know, we're going to go out there. We've got more energy. We're going to, you know, I know it sounds silly, but uh, that's how the players feel. It's, you know, management has their backs. They're going to go out there and play well. They're going to perform well. They have more confidence. Uh, I think, you know, they, I think the mayor is blue it because, again, you're talking about uh, who's their best starter right now. It's uh, not Paxton. It's not Hernandez. A guy by the name of Marco Gonzalez. Uh, 26-year-old uh, Gonzalez, 12-5 and five this season. Um, but he, he's not a guy that you're going to say is going to be your ace or your number one starter. And uh, Paxton, yes, has now alluded to a great pitching performance against Houston. But uh, prior to that, his last two great outings were against Kansas City and Baltimore, two teams that are struggling to play 300 baseball. So, I mean, is this a start of a you know a, a dominant streak by Paxton? Maybe, maybe not. We'll we'll have to see. But I think they did blow it, Lou, by not um, you know, acquiring guys at the deadline. You know, now. We're talking about Felix Hernandez, who's getting the start today. And, and yeah, we've talked about everything he's been to the team over the years. Uh, he was basically the only guy there while everything was falling falling uh, down around him. For management to literally come out and say to a, a guy who's always been at the top, come out and say, okay, today... You're pitching for your job. Doesn't that seem a bit heavy-handed when you consider it's Felix? Yeah, I I can't disagree with that, Lou. But I think at the same time, though, the team is there to win. And and if Felix Hernandez is not helping them, and I'm sure probably they probably broached the subject with them already. We might need you in the bullpen, maybe to you know maybe take a step back and, and maybe work on some things on the side. So I don't know. You're right though. I agree. But at the same time, you're there to win too. But but do you go public like that? Like no, you can go, that, that, that's, that's the thing that Captain that's House. the thing that I that do agree. not get at all. Yeah, you know, fans are going to be coming there tonight, and and it's going to be a big crowd. And whenever Toronto is in town, and the fact that it's a long weekend it can be a hostile crowd if you're a mariner as well yeah and this is what he's going to have to pitch against and i'm just thinking that's not fair to any kind of veteran i mean boston moved david price into the pen when he was struggling just quietly move him into the pen instead of saying hey it's put up or shut up time well i I feel that uh in today's you know so, uh, today's era, I guess, if you will, with social media, um, fans want to know what's going on with the team, with decisions, with lineup changes. And, you know, uh, I'm not a big Twitter guy myself, but I know that lots of fans are f- fans, sorry, are passionate about to their team, and they they might take it as a sign as, hey, uh, our GM is lying to the fan base if you know they don't come out and publicly say this kind of thing. Not that I agree with that line of thinking, but that's what a lot of fans who are passionate about their team might uh, might uh, say, you know, if uh, their GM, in this case, uh, Jared DiPoto of the Mariners, doesn't come out and say what exactly is happening in this situation surrounding Felix Hernandez. Okay, we'll just quickly slip over to the Jays for a minute while we're getting sure. Rob on the line. The Jays did the opposite. They finally threw in the towel. How does that affect the guys in that club, they still got play. They do, and uh, I'll tell you what, uh, the last three games in Oakland didn't look like they really played at all, to be quite honest with you. They, you know, it's it was pretty disheartening seeing uh, highlights of that series against Oakland. They basically laid right down for them, unfortunately. And unfortunately for the Mariners, it do- doesn't help them at all. And, you know, if you look back, if Oakland happens to win this uh, wild card, uh, they can point to that 7-0 and record against Toronto this year. And really, it was Oakland that I thought kind of more or less told the Toronto Blue Jays, no, you're not a contender when they swept that four-game series uh, at the Dome back in May during that uh, Victoria Day weekend. It was really a Victoria Day massacre. It was not good baseball then, and it wasn't good baseball this week in Oakland. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't... I. You know, uh, I was kind of reading an article today about some of the guys who are, uh, you know, Aaron Loop, you know. I mean, they're sad to leave, but also a chance for them to go to a contender. So, that's... That's where things stand right now. I don't know what how the Jays are going to get through the next two months, to be quite honest. 
Yeah, we're joined on the line right now by a special guest. As a matter of fact, it's the host of the show down in Hillsboro, suburb of Portland. Rob, we're just talking about how picking up a player or losing a player can have an effect on a locker room. And you've seen this firsthand with the C's over the years. Kevin Pillar, uh, players like that, where that guy shows up and it's like, hey, man, we're going somewhere now. Just how much does it affect you know, those young players when that stud comes walking? in. Well, there's no doubt. And uh, good evening, guys. I think the one thing that you have to remember is there's always two sides to the equation. There's a, there's a team that gets better and the team that recedes. And right now, the Toronto Blue Jays are obviously a team in recession. And you got to remember, more than just baseball players, these guys are families and they've got, uh, you know, wives and children. And there's a whole lot that goes into the decision to move a player. So, um, you know, from a fan's perspective, you're looking from a salary cap perspective. You're looking from luxury taxes and just, you know, statistical size. But, you know, you've got wives that are friends with other wives on the team and they sit together. And in addition to take a guy like Aaron Luke leaving town, he's got to make sure that his family's ready to go. He's got to make sure that his kids are ready for school and you know there's so many things that go into that so the good thing is when a player usually shows up the team is really quick to em- embrace and welcome a player um, but you are obviously the team that loses that player looking around the clubhouse saying okay well who's going to step up and be the leader who's my wife going to hang out with now that her friend is all of a sudden in Los Angeles or Philadelphia and uh, those are the things that you talk about in a clubhouse just as much as wins and losses Exactly, uh, uh, Rob. Uh, this is KP here. So I, I guess what I want to ask you, Rob, is um, with the Blue Jays' current situation, having um, lost so many games and having lost so many faces, um, what, like, what is this um, going to do to the the team the last two months of the season? Well, I would call it an open audition. Uh, It's an audition for players that are obviously looking to come back and even for some of the young guys who want to play well in front of John Gibbons. Now, that is the secondary part to the equation. Is Obviously, John Gibbons has no bullets left in the chamber. He's at the mercy of the rest of the American League from this point until the end of the season. And the million-dollar question that I think is starting to, you know, answer itself is will John Gibbons be the long-term solution for this organization? I got to think he's next on the list of things to move on from. Uh, again, a great guy, very respected within the Blue Jays organization, one of the winningest managers in franchise history, but he's not a guy that's going to sit around for the next two, three years and sit here and, you know, work with the Vladdy Guerrero Juniors and Kevin Biggio's of the world. So, you know, if I'm the Toronto Blue Jays right now, I understand these moves had to happen. You have to cut off some of the dead wood in order to give those opportunities to the names like Ryan Barucki and Sean Reed Foley. So I understand the moves. They're the right moves to make, and I'm actually lucky or, or happy that the Jays were lucky enough to find a dance partner with most of these players. But now comes the tough times. I mean, everybody wants to talk about the Blue Jays having a rebuild. Well, guess what? It's now sitting right in your lap, and uh, I look at it just like a two-month audition. Hey, Rob, it's Niall. Uh, I know we talked about this uh, previously, but uh, we've been t- talking a bit about the future of John Gibbons, and uh, and I think we both kind of agree that we think he's probably safe for the entire season, but if things really go pear-shaped in Seattle, um, and, and just the way the team performed in Oakland, where I, I didn't think they looked very inspired at all, and I think John Gibbons, he looks like a man who's at the end of his rope. Do you think maybe something might happen before the season's out? It would be a grave mistake for the Blue Jays to do anything more uh, more from a PR perspective than the, what they've already done. The thing you can say about John Gibbons is fans have come to like him. They might not like him as a manager, but they like him as a person. And you don't want to see bad things happen to good people when you've just fleeced your team of some of its talent. Uh, for me, the smart play is let John Gibbons get through the season. Trust me, the Blue Jays have bigger things to worry about than Gibby. But I also say to myself, I would be mystified if they brought him back long term. And that that to me is one of those things where you sit there and you say to yourself, okay, good guy, likable, but he's also a veterans manager, a guy that leans back in the chair and lets the guys run their own operation. It's kind of like a small business within the clubhouse. And I think right now you're going to need a guy that's got a little more structure. Um, he's very understanding of what the minor league system looks like for the Toronto Blue Jays right now. And a couple of names that are being bandied about right now. And you mentioned there's a name at AAA, but for my money, I'm going to put it out there again and I'm going to bang this drum as much as I can. 
the Blue Jays would be real smart to add John Schneider to his staff. It doesn't have to be as the manager of the team, but a guy that has seen Vladdy come through the system, a guy that's seen Bo Bichette come through the system, a guy that has his finger right on the pulse on what this Blue Jay team is going to look like in two to three years. So from that perspective, uh, you know what? You can go a couple of different ways. Last thing you want to do is bring in a name. Last thing you want to do is keep Dead Wood. So to me, he lasts a season and then you move on. You know, Rob, it's interesting that you, you brought up John Schneider's name because as we're bring, you know talking about this here, I'm thinking, okay, come September when they, of course, expand the rosters, now you're really talking about the open audition for next year. And obviously, the minor league teams, their playoffs won't go quite as long. Do you think, and this has happened before, where a manager is is moved with, say, 20 games left just to kind of give someone a fresh chance and, they're in, you know, and play the young guys? Do you think it might come to that? Yeah, I mean, it could. I, I don't know really what Ross, or Ross Atkins and Mark Shapiro's history is when it comes to those situations, but it wouldn't be the worst decision to make. I mean, you've got right now, realistically, three or four guys that could probably break through and give you a couple of innings in September. I don't know if I would rush position players. I know that people are going to say, well, if Vladdy has a good week or two uh, at Buffalo, that maybe he'd be a September call-up, and uh, you know what? He might be, because I can tell you this, and this is the only reason that you bring up a guy like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. this season, is I can tell you right now, the hardest thing in Toronto to sell these tickets to a Blue Jay game because no fan in September when your game when your team is 30 games out after the run that they've had over the last three years nobody's rushed into the box office so what brings the boys to the yard it would be it would be a guy like Vladdy Guerrero Jr. but that would be it he's the only player in the system that would garner ticket sales at this point so I think TV ratings are going to be down radio ratings are going to be down ticket sales are going to be down and Rogers has to I think we just lost Rob there. Maybe the phone service down in uh, in Portland isn't as good as we thought. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> maybe Rob skipped that payment. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll work on getting Rob back for a couple of minutes. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean that's that's the truth. If you're going to bring Vladdy Guerrero up. It's for one reason and one reason only, and that is to sell seats. And I'd be concerned about that because even if you only sell 3,000 extra seats a game, okay, which is a possibility, Yeah. well, that's going to be 30,000 extra seats. Well, you know what? I don't know how much it's really going to move the needle as far as Guerrero, uh, you know, being called up to Toronto. I'm sure it'll lead to a few fans, but I don't think it's going to be 50,000 a night at the Dome. I mean, uh, I think winning is really the only thing that brings fans out to the ball- ballpark. Now, Rob, uh, are you back? If you are... I am. The okay. I, I am. The irony is I have a phone plan with Rogers, so they must have heard me ripping them, and they're <laughs> ready to cut bait on me before I even finish my thought on it. But <laughs> bottom line, and I like completely agree with you, it doesn't move the needle a lot, but at least Guerrero raises a few eyebrows as everybody wants to see the future of the organization. Well, uh, Rob, uh, forget the September Cobbs for now. What about Cobbs right now? Because tonight down in Seattle, we have a guy, Tyler Clippert, making his first start in the big leagues in 10 years. His last start came in 2008. So why not bring up a guy to make the start instead of having Clippert, who we know is not you know, a long-term part of this uh, team? Uh, why not just audition some guys right now? Well, I think it's what environment do you want your future playing in? And I think right now you've got a pretty good situation going on in Buffalo. You've got a pretty good situation in New Hampshire. They're playoff bound. So, I mean, it's one thing to send a kid to the major leagues and say welcome. It's another thing to put him in an environment where you can succeed. And right now I can tell you two things. That Blue Jays clubhouse is real quiet. As everybody knows, they're playing out the string. And then you also look at it from really a productivity standpoint. And where is that player best served? And the media is looking for stories. The team up in Toronto right now is a little, you know, it's enchanted, so why not just keep them where they are, where they can at least succeed and play with a winning team and, you know, then at spring training decide what you've got and put your ducks in a row. For me, I wouldn't bring them up because Toronto for me is the worst case scenario or at least the worst environment to put them in. Hey Rob, just uh, one last question. Uh, this uh, coming out today uh, about Dalton Pompey, uh, that he was pulled from a game recently after a, a, a disagreement with uh, uh, Bison's manager Bobby Meacham. And uh, I know we've talked about this before. We've been questioning the future of Dalton Pompey. It looks like 
you know, it looks like it's pretty much sealed. I think that that incident may have sealed his fate, no matter who's right or who's wrong. And, and it's unfortunate because Pompey looked like he was starting to come on again with the bat. And it, it just looks like his days with the Blue Jays organization are probably coming to an end sooner rather than later. Well, I said it down at spring training that the Jays didn't have any vested interest in Dalton Pompey, whether, uh, you know, you look at him from a health perspective or an ability perspective. And I was dragged through the mud for even mentioning his health. But the reality is, is Dalton's obviously frustrated. He was the next big thing in Toronto, if you remember, a couple of years ago. It just never came to be because he either, A, couldn't stay healthy or, B, do anything more than steal the odd base. So the Blue Jays probably gave him this season just to see if they could fatten the pain a little bit and maybe get him in a part of a deal. But Dalton Pompey, for me, on the depth chart of outfielders that I would call up, he's not even in my top three at this point. So I'm sure he's probably frustrated. I'm sure that the Blue Jays are probably frustrated. you got to remember this is one other thing that a lot of people don't take into consideration. That's not Ross Atkins' guy. That's not Mark Shapiro's guy. That is an Alex Anthopoulos prospect that really the new regime has no vested interest in. Cool, he's Canadian. So was Rob Ducey. So was Rob Butler. At the end of the day, Dalton Pompey has not done enough to step to the forefront when, when he is healthy. And when he's not healthy, I think those numbers actually outweigh the healthy game. So to me, you cut bait with a guy, maybe he signs as a free agent somewhere else. And who knows? Maybe he turns into a heck of a player. But I saw the writing on the wall two years ago. Can't stay healthy. Can't produce in key situations. And is starting to uh, get a little disenchanted. For me, I can't cut him fast enough. You know, Rob, we still have about a minute and a half left. Uh, let's yeah. qu- quickly switch over to the C's. Now, we remember the first half of the season with that division, and it seems everyone has left off right where, you know, they're, they're right back where they left off, and everybody is packed in. Can somebody break out of this? Yeah, you know what? I look at last night's game as kind of a microcosm of the season. The Vancouver Canadians get out to a lead, then they fall behind. How about this for a story? I know a lot of people weren't listening to CanadiansBaseball.com last night that might be listening here today, but the Canadians were down 4-2 going to the top of the ninth, and they get a three-run home run from Otto Lopez. So all of a sudden, the Canadians are up 5-4. They've got three outs to go. They're rushing to get their bullpen ready. And it wasn't enough, and it wasn't in time. They gave up four runs at the bottom of the night. So it was give it and take it away, and that's the problem for the Vancouver Canadians this year is they always seem to be one note behind. It's like that bad singer at a karaoke bar. You know they've got the talent. They just can't keep the rhythm or the beat, and that's why you don't want to hear them sing anymore. So the Canadians are going to have to learn to get on key with everybody else in the division because I'll tell you this, Spokane looks good, Everett looks good, Tri-City's coming around, but the Canadians really just have to hold the, hold the fort for the next two weeks. I mean, if you told me that the Canadians would still be, still be in a conversation with a 10-game, 13-day road trip, I'd probably question your sobriety. But at the end of the day, if they can stay within three games, four games, they've got 17 of their final 23 at home. And if they can stay within the hunt, I think they'll be just fine. But they're going to need to not have what happened last night happen again anytime soon. Uh, thanks a lot, Rob, for uh, calling in and joining us on your own show here. Um, <laughs> have, have Hold a, the phone, guys. Yeah. You guys are doing a great job, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, have a, have a good time in Portland. Uh, hopefully the uh, Seas pick it up again. Uh, you can catch that game on CanadiansBaseball.com. And uh, hopefully we'll see you up here next week. Thank you, boys. Appreciate thanks. it. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. We'll be uh, right back talking a little bit more Jays Mariners here. Here on TSN 1040, you're listening to Vancouver Canadians game day. One, you know, the worst batting order, and keep in mind there are guys hurt, that I have ever seen the Toronto Blue Jays put forward. This reminds me of some of the C lineups uh, in the Oakland days. I mean, you've got Russell Martin, Smoke, okay, then Brandon Drury, Solarte, Diaz, Hernandez, Grichik, Granderson, Kendry Morales as your designated out. I mean, that's... That's not going to scare anybody, KP. Uh, uh, absolutely not, Lou. And uh, you know, yeah, we do have. They do have some guys injured. Um, but uh, the funny thing, of course, is if we're looking at um, like right now, I know uh, you know guys uh, have you know been injured and whatnot. Pilar's not in the lineup and and all that. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, this season the Jays have outscored the Mariners. And they have also out homered the Mariners. So if we're going to do like a K 
comparison uh, by position, I don't know. Uh, it might be a push between the two teams. Well, when you take into account the stadiums, the Jays should out homer out homer the Mariners. But you know what? There's there is some hope on the horizon uh, now because yeah, you know what? The batting order looks pretty bad, but then you've got that. Starting rotation. <laughs> um, now we've talked about Clippard going tonight, and and you have to remember the Jays, th- you know, trade away some some bullpen arms. So where is that? Okay, here's something that we can lean on. I mean, right now, as it shapes, Marcus Stroman's the ace of this starting staff, even though Clippard has a better record. Is there anything that they can look at and say, okay, guys? Let's lean on these guys. Uh, Brandon Compton, maybe. Uh, no, <laughs> it's it's pretty. Uh, yeah, I you know I'm I'm actually shocked uh, that that someone like Brandon Compton. Uh, he's he's ba- basically it's a journeyman. Yeah, and that's yeah. and I, I'm shocked. He w- when I heard his he was being called up from Buffalo, I I was really surprised about that. I thought maybe they would you know. Uh, give maybe give somebody like a Sean Reed Foley a shot. Uh, maybe a. Maybe uh, T.J. Zoik even. I, I don't know. It's just, uh, it, it's, uh, but, you know, I, I can kind of understand it. It's a pretty intense environment, Seattle and Toronto. And it, I think it's really going to be intense this year because the Mariners are, are contending. Blue Jays are not. But, you know, the Blue Jays nation has basically invaded Seattle, and which has been really an annual occurrence over the last few years anyway. So, yeah, I mean, right now it stands as Estrada, Stroman, Gavilio, Baraki, and then basically, uh, basically just Johnny Holstaff, starting with uh, Tyler Baraki this evening. You know, KP, when you've got a starting staff like this that really, quite honestly, can't really give you a lot of innings, and you've traded away your bullpen, what's that going to do for these guys as starters? I mean, you're hoping to get five out of them. And then it's like, cross your fingers that we can hold on to a lead if we get one. Like, one of these guys, Clippard may go out tonight, and for all we know, may throw a sparkling five innings. They yank him out after 80 pitches, and then luck out. Well, you know, Lou, we were talking about this back in April or early in the season when, you know, they still had the, you know, the normal strong rotation and guys weren't even going deep into the, into the games back then. And yeah. we knew that this would come back and bite them because the bullpen can't go out there and pitch every night and uh, pitch long or sorry, pitch multiple innings every night because there, there was no starter out there uh, that was going to go. Uh, seven, eight, nine innings uh, on a regular basis. And uh, of course, the game has changed, Lou. But again, you're lo- looking like uh, at a guy like Ryan Baraki, who is going tomorrow. Um, and, uh, you know, how many innings are you get- going to get out of him? Um, five innings? Six? Uh, you got Marco Estrada coming up on Saturday in the game against James Paxton. Um, Estrada, a veteran, I mean, coming off a blister prom, I, you know, how many innings is he going to give you? And then, and Sunday you've got uh, in the series finale, uh, Sam Gavilio. Um, again, what do you expect out of this guy? So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a situation where it feels like you're lucky if these guys give them five innings even. Like, um, and... The bullpen, you know, what are you going to do with uh, with that? You you can of course call up um, guys, t- you know, just on on a emergency basis from Buffalo, as the you know team has done over the years. But uh, this is not going to be pretty in terms of uh, how this pitching staff is going to look the rest of the season. And of course, um, I guess a lucky thing for the for the Blue Jays this weekend is that they're playing against a Seattle team that isn't that good offensively either. So, you know. You know, um, I guess if you're a Blue Jays fan, you keep your, your fingers crossed. It, just one stat to throw out, and you know, I don't like using stats too much. In all of Major League Baseball, only one team has fewer quality starts than the Blue Jays, and that's Correct. Kansas City. Oh, okay. Kansas City. Oh, wow. I, that's what I thought, too. I'm like, really? <laughs> only can- Kansas City has 34 in 107 games. Okay. The Jays have 35. Second worst. Houston, of course, leads the majors with 73 out of 110 games. Phenomenal stuff. Okay, let's get off these Blue Jays because now I'm getting depressed. The team (laughs) they are playing, the home team, also going through a little bit of a depression as well. The Seattle Mariners. Here's the the medicine that's been delivered to them. Um, We look at what's gone right for the Mariners this year. And what was going right all that time, because let's forget, they're still a minus nine, was they were winning those one-run games. That's not happening anymore. What do they need to do to get back to small ball? Well, 
Yeah, I think it's just basically a case of getting back to the basics. Actually, just before we get on with the Mariners, I think we might be a little uh, optimistic about Tyler Clippard, considering that uh, he's only pitched uh, his longest outing this year. It was only his last couple of outings, one and a third inning. So uh, maybe if we, wow. maybe if you, uh, the Jays get two out of him, uh, maybe they'll call it a night. Auditioning but, for Tampa. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The opener. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think for the Mariners right now, I think they just kind of have to reset and look, say, look, the lead's gone, but you know what? There's still basically two months of baseball left to go. Just take a deep breath. They know Robinson Cano is going to be coming back pretty soon. I know he's not going to be available for the playoffs, but you know that's something that they can hang their hat on. James Paxson getting healthy again. That's something else they can uh, lean on. And Wade LeBlanc, Marco Gonzalez, that's been a pretty decent trio of uh, Mariners starters. And their bullpen's outstanding with uh, Diaz and Colome. And I like I like the, how they beefed up their bullpen at the trade deadline. So I, I don't think all is lost for the Mariners here. Well, hopefully for their sake, they do something this weekend because they do have someone to meet up on if they can. Uh, we've only got one segment left. We're going to bring you right up to the Mariners and Jays. Rick Riz down in Safeco. Um, I believe Matt Sakaris and Blake Price are down there probably enjoying some Washington State beer. But we're going to come back and finish talking about the Jays, the uh, Mariners, and maybe we'll sprinkle in some more Major League Baseball talk. You are listening to Vancouver Canes Game Day here on TSN 1040. I think Paul Beeson, I think he was the one who might have put a bug in the ear of, of the schedule yeah. makers. And Paul Beeson, who did work in the commissioner's office, he's got a bit of pull there. And I think I think he might have led the way. I think I read something to that effect that I said, can we maybe just look at getting Jay Seattle on weekends in Seattle more often? And looks like it's been paying off and uh, fans are definitely liking it. So, I mean, it doesn't seem to matter when they come, they'll come. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been the one in the last few years just because uh, I'm busy. And it was a weekday. Yeah. So we all played hooky and went down there, and it was uh, and Batista hit a home run. Nice. Thank you very much. Life but of course, good. and the Mariners won, and yes, enjoyed some fine Washington beer. Now, as usual, when we are off mic here, we have some very, very interesting conversations, sometimes better than the ones we have on air. <laughs> um, and we're talking about Sean Kelly. Now, you may not know who that is, he was a relief pitcher. Was yes, for the was. Washington mm-hmm. Nationals, and while they were in the midst of hammering the Mets, he gave up a home run, which made the score twenty-five to four. So I mean, hey, you know, it's getting close. He threw, walked off the mound, and threw his glove to the ground. Not just soft toss, you know, overhand slam. Very, very next day, the Washington Nationals designate him for assignment, which is a polite way of cutting a player yeah, because um, they're either going to send him to the minors or waive him. I like it. I really, really like that they're doing that. And I understand they wouldn't do that with a star player. But you now, as you were saying it, respect the uniform. Yeah, respect the uniform and... You know, let's face it. I mean, when you're when you're getting it handed to you like that, twenty five to four, frustrations are running high, and uh, and I think Sean Kelly probably wondering why the heck is he out there, um, probably questioning. Well, unfortunately, sometimes uh, there are parts of every job. Everybody has to, you know, do their job, and I guess Kelly was not in the mood for it. And uh, you know, it's. You know, it's 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 unfortunate. It's unfortunate for Kelly. I'm sure he'd like to take that back right now, but I think he's talented enough that somebody's probably going to pick him up, and I think really it's a lesson learned, but things have been just rough in Washington all season long. It's... Uh you know, it's it's been a very disappointing year. There was talk about Bryce Harper maybe being traded at the deadline, but the Nationals electing to keep him for now. You know, I I don't know if they I don't know if they've even tried to clear him on waivers. Who knows? I mean, the, I mean, trades still can be made, but at this point now, players have to clear waivers. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you just can't you can't show up your manager like that. You you have to you know act with some sense of decorum, for lack of a better word. And KP, now that game was already out of the hand. We said what the final score was twenty five to four, worst loss in Mets history, which is saying something because they were really really bad for a really really long time. It, there's a lot of unwritten rules in baseball, you know. And when you, a, a game with scores like that, I mean, they brought in Jose Reyes for crying out loud. It, at what point does a player have to say, okay, guys, the game's over, let's just get through this, and we all go home? Or, or if, you're, if you're, you know, the Nationals, do you do what they do in football? And it's like, you ain't care when to start putting in the scrubs so no one gets hurt. Like, 
Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you if you're ahead by that many runs or down by that many runs, there's always, um, you know, the the risk of uh, having someone getting hit. You know, uh, maybe uh, in retaliation for something that happened early in the game or early in the series. Uh, this is this will be the time to you know get you know, send some messages that way. So I mean, if you're ahead by you know by the the lead is insurmountable. I would definitely pull the starters for sure. Just uh, you you don't want to pad your stats you know, if you're the offensive team if you're leading by that many runs. Uh, I would agree with that. But uh, on the other hand, you still want to play the game in a respectful manner. And I remember in '92, and this is a totally different situation when uh, Jack Morris was going for his 20th victory. I believe it was in Yankees Stadium, and the rain was coming down. That's right. Uh, I think it was Alfredo Griffin who was uh, swinging at three very wild pitches to you know try to get the game over to get uh, to the fifth inning. That's right. Yeah, that, that's when it Alfredo would be an official Griffin game. with that wild yeah. swing. Yes. So I mean, you still have to re- re- respect the game and play the right way. But I, I don't have a problem with pulling starters. You have to wonder if there should be a mercy rule in effect at some point. I had no problem with that. I mean, there's no. It, it would have to be a decent amount. I mean, yeah. but that game was over. Yeah. You know, Nogi uh, Berra would say it was over. <laughs> he would say it is over. He definitely would say it is over. Now, you were talking earlier about John Gibbons, and John Gibbons has had a couple of doozy run-ins with players. Yes. Um, uh, both of whom, you know, not too long after, kind of disappeared. Of course, there was Shea Hillebrand, and then of course the famous Ted Lilly. Ted Lilly, situation. that's right. I think, uh, yeah, uh, when Gibby came out to the mound, I think Ted Lilly threw some kind of uh, some kind of strange pitch. I don't know if it was an Ephus pitch or something like that, but something John silly. Gibbons came out and said, "What the heck are you doing?" Uh, the uh, the sanitized version, and uh, yeah, things just kind of took off from there and continued down to the clubhouse. Yeah, Ted Lilly basically would not to give give the ball up. You know, took his ball and went home. You know, that's all the time we have for tonight. Um, we will not be on the air next week, and following that, of course, the Seas are back in town. Lots of baseball still coming. Jays, Mariners, Rick Riz from Safeco Field right here on the home of baseball, TSN 1040. You've been listening to Vancouver Canadians Game Day.